There's a reason collectors, survivalists, and even old machinists still marvel at the steel from World War II. You walk into an old military surplus store, run your hands along a bayonet or a toolbox from the 1940s, and it's pristine, solid, heavy, almost untouchable by rust. Meanwhile, your brand new tools, knives, and even some car parts, all pockmarked with corrosion, barely make it five years. What's going on here? How did World War II engineers make steel that seems almost immortal? And is there a way to replicate it today? The truth is part metallurgy, part wartime necessity, and entirely fascinating. Let's break it down. The steel of World War II was made under extreme precision and necessity, unlike today's mass production. During the war, every piece of equipment had to perform flawlessly under the harshest conditions. Soldiers weren't going to send a rifle back to the factory because the barrel had a thin layer of rust. To achieve this, steel makers worked with far fewer impurities than most modern manufacturers tolerate. Iron ores were carefully selected, smelted, and alloyed with precision. Carbon content, manganese, nickel, and chromium were adjusted in exact proportions, not just to make strong steel, but to make steel that would last decades, even in salty, humid, or battlefield conditions. Modern steel, by contrast, is produced at an industrial scale with cost efficiency in mind. The slightest compromise on purity or alloy content to save money drastically shortens its lifespan. World War II steel didn't have these compromises. For example, the American Sherman tank hulls and German Mauser rifles were not just designed to work. They were designed to endure the worst environments imaginable, from North African deserts to Russian winters. That kind of attention to metallurgical detail is rare today. Wartime steel was often air-cooled or water-quenched with care, not on an assembly line. Another major difference lies in the way steel was treated after it was forged. World War II steel often underwent careful quenching processes. The metal was heated and cooled in specific ways to reduce internal stress while enhancing corrosion resistance. In many cases, water and oil quenching were used to make sure the molecular structure was optimized for durability, a process that modern mass production shortcuts cannot replicate. For example, bayonets and machine gun barrels were cooled slowly or in oil baths to prevent microscopic cracks. These cracks might be invisible to the naked eye, but they are corrosion's first entry point. Modern steel often comes off conveyor belts cooled quickly and treated with cheap coatings, enough to sell in stores, but not enough to survive decades. Additives like chromium nickel and molybdenum made World War II steel impervious to rust. Alloying elements played a major role. World War II steelmakers understood that small amounts of chromium and nickel could form a passive oxide layer on the surface of steel. This layer is incredibly tough and prevents water and oxygen from penetrating, effectively making the steel stainless long before stainless steel was a consumer staple. German U-boat hulls, for instance, relied on low-carbon, high-chromium steel to survive years of saltwater immersion. Similarly, aircraft like the P-51 Mustang use steel components with carefully controlled alloying to prevent corrosion in high-altitude, high-moisture conditions. Modern steels often skip these high-cost additives unless they're marketed as premium. That's why a World War II shovel can look perfect after 70 years, while your $30 garden spade is already rusting. 
The old-school forging and machining process sealed steel against rust in ways modern factories don't attempt. Forging techniques mattered just as much as chemical composition, you know. During World War II, steel was hammered, rolled, and pressed in ways that aligned the grain of the metal, reducing weak spots where rust could form. In some cases, components were even hand-finished and polished to remove micro-imperfections. These imperfections might be invisible, but in modern high-speed stamping or casting processes, they're pretty common and act as rust magnets. For practical survivalists, this means that if you're building tools or repairing steel parts, taking the time to polish, file, and treat the steel after cutting or welding can dramatically increase its lifespan. You don't need a factory, just the mindset of paying attention to where moisture might accumulate. Simple steps today can help your steel mimic World War II durability. Understanding World War II, steel gives you actionable knowledge, really. First, focus on quality over quantity. High carbon steel with at least some alloy content will always last longer. Second, heat treatment and cooling methods matter. Even a small batch of steel components, if properly tempered, can resist rust far better than mass market equivalents. Third, surface protection is critical. Historical steel often relied on oiling or bluing, a chemical process that created a corrosion resistant layer. You can apply these today with modern equivalents like gun oil, wax coatings, or controlled bluing for small tools. For example, if you are restoring an old survival knife, carefully stripping any rust polishing it, and then applying a thin layer of protective oil can give you a lifespan reminiscent of World War II steel. Similarly, homemade or survivalist steel projects, like spades, axe heads, or firearm parts, benefit enormously from attention to finish and protection rather than rushing the process. World War II steel's longevity wasn't accidental. It was a product of necessity, skill, and pride. Perhaps the most fascinating part is the human factor. World War II metallurgists and engineers were deeply invested in the performance of every component. The survival of soldiers, tanks, ships, and aircraft depended on their expertise. They didn't treat steel as disposable. They treated it as critical to life and mission. This focus on durability over convenience created a culture where steel was crafted with longevity in mind. By contrast, you know, modern industrial priorities rarely reward longevity. Products these days are designed to last just long enough to satisfy warranty periods. For a history enthusiast or survivalist, this creates a clear lesson. Paying attention to quality, process, and finishing isn't just about nostalgia. It's about creating items that can endure for decades under stress. Applying World War II lessons can, well, make your steel last decades. Whether you're a collector, a prepper, or simply someone who enjoys high-quality tools, you can take inspiration from the past. Start by selecting steels with known high-carbon content and a bit of corrosion-resistant alloying. Treat the steel carefully during shaping, cutting, or welding. And finally, don't underestimate the importance of surface protection. A simple application of oil or wax, or even a controlled chemical patina, can really extend the life of your steel far beyond what you thought possible. Even modern metal parts, if treated this way, can actually approach the resilience of those World War II originals. 
The key takeaway here is that World War II steel was never about luck. It was about attention to detail, chemistry and process. By studying these methods and applying them in practical ways, you can make sure your steel doesn't die in five years, but survives for decades, even in harsh conditions. It's not just history. It's a lesson in craftsmanship that, honestly, still pays off today. If you found this guide valuable, make sure to subscribe to Forgotten Frontlines for more deep dives into the ingenuity and endurance of historical technology. Share this with fellow history buffs and survivalists who want to learn how the past can make their gear stronger, their tools last longer, and their understanding of durability just a little sharper. World War II steel wasn't just metal. It was a mindset, and now you can bring that mindset into your own projects.